The Gloriana Set by Theobin Moon, read by Alamex Mabella. Chapter 60 Tactics. This chapter discusses the Inter House Quidditch match. This event is a bit confusing because the teams are a mix of all houses, so the author prepared a little cheat sheet so everyone can play along at home. Annie and his prefects are still arguing over the team names, so we'll call them Huge Team and Lavinia Team for now. Lavinia Team Captain and Lavinia Clark. Keeper Astoria Greengrass, Slytherin. Seeker Ginevra Weasley, Gryffindor. Beaters two Hufflepuffs. Chasers a Slytherin and two Ravenclaws. Hooch Team Captain Madame Hooch. Keeper Demelza Robbins, Gryffindor. Seeker Draco Malfoy, Slytherin. Beaters the Lundy Twins, Gryffindor. Chasers a Slytherin, Ravenclaw and a Hufflepuff. How could you do that to me? Draco demanded, slamming into the patient's lap that afternoon. Hermione jumped, startled, and bottles rattled on the shelves. How could you trap me with Potter in that alcove? He cried. Whatever did you say to Blaze? He mentioned you and his voice was dripping with poison. Obviously, you and Harry needed time to work out your feelings. Hermione said airily, knowing she sounded like Bluebell. She couldn't help smiling at the idea of the two men squabbling in that tiny alcove, taking a half hour to break a ward that they should have ripped down in minutes. She knew that because the ward was set to notify her when it was broken. You'll pay for that little stunt, Draco growled, stepping closer, his hands on the shelf behind her. Promise? She whispered. His eyes darkened and his lips brushed hers. No, no, stop that right now! ordered a sharp voice. Hermione looked around Draco's shoulder at Harry, who stood in the doorway, and sensed. Draco, of course, took this as his cue to give her a hard, thorough kiss before stepping away. Hermione, wipe that smile off your face! Harry snapped. I'm here to protect you all, remember? What if something had happened while we were in that alcove? It's bad enough that Ginny saw. Butter! Hermione blinked. Jenny found you two in the alcove. This was getting better and better. And that daft fairy, too. Harry went on, ignoring Draco's glass. I can't believe she's teaching defense against the dark arts. Bluebell is actually quite insightful, Hermione said, just to wind him up. Harry and Draco gave her identical looks of disbelief. Honestly, they were more alike than they knew. Drag me to a classroom, she did, Harry grumbled. Let me sit on giant flower and take tea with her. Can't see why you would object, Potter, Draco said. Seeing how you adore having tea with the half-giant, Bluebell is only a step up. The two friends glared at him. Hagrid is brilliant, Hermione said to Draco. Obviously, I need to bring you to tea soon. She turned to Harry. I think Draco has a soft spot for Bluebell. She always calls him lovely boy. Draco only smirked. It's better than sweet saviour. Harry's jaw tightened. Aren't we here for a reason? He asked. Or do you two just come here to play around? The other two sobered instantly as Harry pulled the vial out of his aura robes. Hermione picked up a pair of tongs as Draco lifted the lid of the blood potion. Draco's face was suddenly paler and Hermione understood his reluctance. If the patient turned deep purple, it meant his father had somehow reached into the very walls of Hogwarts to continue his deadly vendetta against Nuggleborns, even as Draco himself entered a public relationship with one. If the potion was clear or pale purple, that would be worse. Draco himself would remain the top suspect, Veritas Serum or no. Draco, or perhaps Narcissa. Hermione grimaced, not looking forward to that conversation. Using the tongs, Hermione dipped the vial into the potion and held it up. Draco replaced the cauldron lid. Pour a little of the blood into the vial, she said to Harry. A few drops will be enough. Harry's mouth was set in a thin line, but his hand didn't tremble as he tipped a few drops into the open vial. The potion inside instantly turned deep purple. 
Draco's face was expressionless, but his hand gripped the edge of the table. Hermione quickly corked the potion and put it in her pocket. Give me Lucius' blood, Harry, she said. What? No, I. You must, Harry, she said impatiently. You said that Aurors need a warrant to get access to visitor docks. Well, this potion might be enough to get that warrant. We have to tell Kingsley, and I have to be holding Lucius' blood. I won't have you covering for me, Harry said. If you lie and tell him you stole it. Oh, don't be so bloody noble and use your hat for once, putter, Draco snapped. She has no intention of saying anything at all. She just give Shackleboard a sly smile and McGonagall will proclaim brightest witch of her age. Hermione had to smile at Draco's McGonagall imitation, which she privately felt was much better than his Hermione imitation. She never sounded like that. Harry looked at her and she nodded. We well, have to tell the headmistress anyway, she said. I promised I'd tell her if the potion yielded any information. All right, Harry said. I'll send Kingsley Patronus. He opened the door to leave the patient's lamp. His stack would never fit in such a small space, then turned to look at Draco. Look, Malfoy, I'm sorry, Harry said. About Lucius, I mean, if he's convicted. Hermione's blood ran cold. If Lucius was convicted of attacking Muggleborn students, he'd be executed. His stay of execution reduced to lifelong imprisonment in Azkaban was dependent on good behavior. She looked at Draco, whose mouth was twisted in a scorn. It's all right, Potter, he said. My father simply wouldn't be comfortable if he wasn't trying to destroy my life and everyone else's. Hermione's hand reached out for his, but Draco didn't respond. Lucia's actions, once public, would make it almost impossible for Draco to clear the family name. It was bad enough that his father was a convicted Death Eater who only turned at the last minute to save his skin and that of his families. If Lucius was convicted of continuing his Death Eater work in Azkaban and executed for it, hot red rage flooded her body. It wasn't fair. Draco was trying to change in that horrible, evil man. Hermione! Oh, she could hear Draco pleading with her. Hermione, stop! Her sight cleared. She was on her knees, and so was Draco. His nose was inches from hers. Hermione, he repeated. She looked around and saw bottles shattered, spilling liquids on the shelves and floors. Harry was yelling her name too, but she could hardly hear it. It's not fair, Draco, she told him. Oh, I know, he said calmly, but we're going to stop him anyway, and we can't if you smash up the patient's lap and kill us all. Okay, she said in what she thought was a very calm, reasonable voice. Draco pulled her to him, and she buried her face in his school jumper, breathing him in. Does this happen often? She had Harry ask softly over her head. I don't know, he answered just as softly, but she's very protective of me. Ah, I'll, I'll be outside. She had Harry open the door and close it behind him. Why do I keep doing this? she moaned. She felt him shrug. The wall, most likely. It affects people differently. I've seen it before. In, in, she couldn't say it. He sighed. Yes, in the dungeons. My family's dungeons. Witches and wizards left suffering too long would lose control, smash up their prison. He took a deep breath. Kill themselves by accident. Accident, she repeated hollowly. If I had to guess, I'd say the war changed your magic, Draco said. You spent so long in constant danger. His voice broke a bit at that, but steadied, and he continued. Your magic thinks you're still in peril all the time. There are moments of strong emotions. He trailed off. Hermione pulled away and looked up at him. Strong emotions? Yes. He said that with that open look that squeezed her heart. Strong emotions. He leaned down and kissed her, his voice taking on a teasing tone. Now that makes me wonder, Hermione, what kind of strong emotions would make you... There was a sudden banging on the patient lab door. Malfoy, Hermione, called Harry's voice. Kingsley is in McGonagall's office. Right then, Draco said, waving his wand and vanishing the mess in an instant. Ready? They left the lab and Harry moved closer. All right, Hermione, he asked, frowning. 
She nodded. I'm sorry. Sometimes it just gets away from me. Harry nodded. When Ginny told me about Zabini, he swallowed. I went home and walked into the sitting room and calmly opened a butter beer. Then my sofa burst into flames. He passed and looked with narrowed eyes at Draco, as if daring him to say anything. I'm always afraid something will happen in training or worse, in the field. There wasn't much to say to that, so Hermione just took his hand and squeezed it hard. We have to go. Draco said quietly, stepping aside, so Harry and Hermione could leave the room hand in hand. She glanced back at Draco, but he just nodded. Change, she thought as they climbed the stairs out of the dungeon. We can all change. I'm disturbed, Harry said. You certainly are, Hermione said with a grin as she poured them cider. After so many years of pumpkin juice, they both refused to touch the stuff. Harry scowled at his goblet. My grown adults, he grumbled as he took a sip. I can't see how a little wine could hurt. And you look ridiculous in that school uniform, Hermione, like a snowy owl trying to be a pygmy puff. They were seated across from each other at the far end of the Gryffindor dinner table, a few empty seats affording them a little privacy in the great hall. Half the student populace was staring at them. The famous Harry Potter was the brains of the Golden Trier. They had become used to Hermione, and the flurry round Ron had died down quickly, but then Harry strode in, wearing those dashing aura ropes here to protect them all from another deadly threat. And there was Hermione Granger at his side again, cooking up something secret in the patient's lab and carrying on a mysterious relationship with the most dangerous man in the school. Eyes were on Draco too, expecting him to leap up at any moment and challenge Harry to a duel. But Draco was disappointingly calm, just sitting at a southern table, talking quietly to Pansy and Blaze without even a smouldering look. Harry frowned over his cider. Kingsley's up to something. Hermione shrugged. He seemed reasonable enough at McGonagall's office. Kingsley had, too. He'd accepted their findings about Lucius with a total aplomb and didn't even delve too deeply into how Hermione had procured Lucius' blood. Perhaps he thought that Malfoys kept vats of extra blood around their manor, on hand for dark immortality spells or deathly curses, and Draco had just leveled some up. She giggled a bit at the thought while they sat in McGonagall's office, and Kingsley was nodding sagely as Harry explained the bit about the visitor rolls. It was a giggle, honestly. She did not cackle dementedly, no matter what Draco said afterwards. Draco's behavior had been almost as odd as Kingsley's. It apparently recategorized Harry as a benign presence around Hermione, much like Neville, and had followed them up to McGonagall's office without one snarky remark. When Harry bubbled a bit in his explanation about why he hadn't informed Kingsley early about the potion, Draco had smoothly cut in, somehow implying that Harry had learned about the potion using aura-owned investigative and deductive skills, and that Hermione had sworn him to secrecy. Afterwards, Draco had confessed to some surprise at Kingsley's willingness to believe that, adding that the real story, that Hermione had marched Harry to a cauldron of blood potion and practically shoved his nose into it, was infinitely more believable. Hermione was too relieved to see Draco back in regular form. The wizarding bot simply wasn't prepared for pleasantly helpful Draco Malfoy to think about his words at the time, but Harry obviously had. Now Harry's natural paranoia was focused on Kingsley, and Harry was, as he had admitted over a fine shepherd's pie, disturbed. Kingsley is up to something, he repeated, twirling his fork in his potatoes. His green eyes took on a crazed gleam that Hermione remembered from sixth year. He seemed the most excited. He is probably glad to have a decent lead for once, Hermione said. He's running for Minister of Magic, you know. It would be embarrassing if the Aura's office couldn't solve this. I suppose. Harry said absently, his eyes moving along the table to where Ginny sat ignoring them. Hermione hadn't mentioned Ginny's breakup with Blaze, but Harry was quick to notice the tension. Early in their room, Ginny had insisted that Hermione eat dinner with Harry. The sooner you find out who wrote these messages, the sooner Harry can leave, Ginny had said. I don't need to see this nosy git. Now, Harry was watching Ginny in the Great Hall. 
Apparently, his aura training hadn't extended to discreet surveillance. Kingsley said he could get the visitor rolls, Hermione said, trying to draw Harry's attention. No answer. She huffed. He'd been the one to bring up Kingsley after all, and put down her fork. Harry, you and Ginny have to speak eventually. Harry didn't answer, but he did take his eyes from Ginny to look around the great hall. Hermione followed his gaze and saw Draco leave the Slytherin table and stride to the doors without a look her way. Go ahead, Harry said. His tone, while not entirely enthusiastic, didn't sound as nauseated as usual. Progress indeed. Anyway, Hermione had better things to do than watch Blaze, watch Ginny ignore Harry watching her. She followed Draco to the second floor, slipping into an archive after him. His arms immediately went around her, for a timeless moment, all worries about Lucius and blood messages faded away. Draco seemed to need the reassurance, in the end holding her silently with her head tucked under his chin. I don't trust Checkerboard, he said finally. Hermione rolled her eyes. Let me guess, she said. He accepted my explanation about the vial of Lucius' blood too quickly and seemed too happy to fetch the visitor rolls. Oh, and he wasn't even fussed about Harry keeping our blood potion secret from him. Exactly. Drake released her, looking down into her face. Quite astute of you. I'm correcting Harry, actually, she said with a grin. He said all that during dinner. Draco grimaced at being forced to agree with Harry. Shacklebolt testified against my father, you know. A lot of people did, Hermione said, including Harry. After visiting Ra wanted a piece of Lucius. Shacklebolt? Draco clenched his fists. Shacklebolt was the first to testify. He told the Daily Prophet that it was a travesty of justice that all convicted Death Eaters wouldn't get the kiss. Yes, well, Kingsley did say so. Emotions had been running high in the first week after the battle. She supposed Draco would take a dim view of such words, since he himself was a convicted Death Eater, albeit one with a light probationary sentence. She pushed away the image of Draco's soul sucked out through his mouth, the light dying from his eyes. It wouldn't do to set Diarco's velvet curtains on fire. Draco picked up on her thoughts somehow, and his arms were around her again. It's all right, he murmured. Your father might be executed, she said, looking up at him. And we will have helped convict him. His jaw tightened. If my father is trying to curse Muggleborns all the way from Azkaban, then he deserves it. Hermione opened her mouth. No, don't deny it, he went on. You know it's the truth. You can't save somebody who doesn't want to be saved. Draco was preparing himself, she thought bleakly. He was preparing himself for his father's death. And she had to let him do it, because honestly, she agreed with him. She thought of Narcissa suddenly, that steely, polished mask she wore. Taking socks and books to Lucius every week. Scheming for a pure-blood bride for her son. Sitting alone in that manner. What would she do if Lucius was executed? Hermione felt another lightning bolt of rage against Lucius this time both on Draco's and Narcissa's behalf, and again she ruthlessly suppressed those feelings. Draco's voice broke into her dark thoughts. Oh, I have to leave soon, he said. Widdish practice. On a Monday night. Draco released her and leaned against the wall. I'm a seeker of Madame Hooch's team. She scheduled practice every night this week for inter-house Quidditch match. He frowned. Your pet Hufflepuff has truly bollocks things up this time. There is no way a newly assembled team can come together in four days. Why not? Hermione asked. Just go up there and fly around. Fly around? Draco repeated incredulously. Is that all you think we do up there? Fly around? Quidditch is a game of strategy, Hermione, as well as flying. Hermione quit listening at this point, allowing the passionate flow of Quidditch oration to swirl above her head. It was much more pleasant to lean against Draco's warm chest and feel the vibrations as he spoke and breathe in his cologne. It was all nonsense anyways, to her way of thinking. He just liked to fly around. Not only do we have to adjust our strategies to match that of our teammates, Draco continued, but somehow we have to scout the opposing team under Lavinia Clark and see how... At least his mind is off Lucius now. 
that inter-house match should keep him busy. Hermione might have to attend to opposing team's practices. She didn't trust Astoria up in the air with Ginny. The Lundy twins are my team's beaters, and they have an entirely different approach than the Southern beaters, and I'll have to adjust my... Perhaps Harry could watch Ginny's practices, and would take just a subtle hint. Hermione, are you listening to me? Draco demanded. Of course, she said, blinking up at him. Tactics, very important. Draco rolled his eyes. You are pathetic about Quidditch. She was, rather. No argument there. What will you do while I'm practicing? Draco asked, taking both her hands and entwining their fingers. Raving about Quidditch had improved his mood. It was much like Harry and Ron that way. Study, I suppose. Actually, Hermione was thinking of bringing up another experimental potion, but she'd need an assistant, or at least an advisor. Sarkon wouldn't dare, of course, but maybe... Oh, I'm sorry about this, Draco said, kissing her hands. The match is on Thursday afternoon. We'll find something to do, perhaps afterwards. So I had a hint of suggestion. She smiled up at him. Yes, she said. They either be the all-conquering hero or defeated seeker requiring consolation. Either scenario worked for her. Such a silly game. Draco glanced at his watch. Oh, I have ten more minutes. Just enough time. For what? Hermione asked. I'll show you, he said with a sly smile. And he did. To be continued. Next up, Hermione finds another patience partner. Thank you for listening to this chapter of The Gloriana Set by Theba Moon, read by Anna Max Mabella. If you'd like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on YouTube, Spotify, or AO3.